think where we are as an organization today, I believe that this is the first time that we've had a chance to put this thing together. And I'd like to give you a little background of why I'm saying that. When we first started out as an organization, it was much like American Ag, and for the first three years from 1955 to 1958, we were a protest group. From 1958 to 1968, when we had, after we had developed the collective bargaining program, we had holding actions. That was our program. Now, what do you do after you win one? Then we started out with a marketing program and bargaining. We started putting commodity together. And by no, from 1968 to 1971, we had a lot of product put together. But we were pretty young at it. We'd only been doing it for about three years, learning how. Now, there wasn't a book written on how to do it. You couldn't go to any university or go to the government and find out how to put this together. We didn't know how, what the documentation was, what it needed to be. We didn't have computers. We were operating out of shoeboxes, and as a result, we blew it. We didn't know how to do it. It wasn't anybody's fault, we just simply didn't know how. And as a result of not knowing how, it created a big fight in the organization in 1972 and almost tore us right down through the middle. Well, you don't build collective bargaining by turning it apart again, and that's what we did. Problems on both sides. We just didn't understand. We weren't communicating. Then 73 come along, and from 73 to 76, who needed anything? Prices were good. It's always been a sad commentary that it's very difficult to organize farmers until it's almost too late, instead of recognizing what our problem really is. And I suspect during 73 to 76, I heard a lot of people saying that well, you'll never see $5 wheat again. We thought we'd reach the magic day. Well, you all, all know what's happened since. About the time we were ready to start making some advances again, there was a new group that come on the scene, and they stole our thunder. It was exciting. They went to Washington, they drove tractors, and they were protesting. I don't intend to criticize them in any way. I have one good thing to say about them. They woke up a lot of people to the fact that there was a problem who we'd had a problem waking up. But today, we're in a whole new ball game. And that's only been about since the beginning of the year. Almost tore us apart as an organization. We're almost financially on our backside. And since the first of the year, we've turned around I, don't, I think the attitude of farmers has turned around, the interest rates, the inflation. I don't believe there's a farmer out here that doesn't know something has to be done. It took us five years after the wreck we had in 72 to set up a system that functioned. You know how long it took Cargill to set up their system so that it could work, the documentation and all the check writing and everything that they needed to put theirs together. It took them 15 years to perfect it. Well, we're still perfecting ours, but it works the way it is. But we're going to increase the amount of capabilities on the computer by tenfold. And we should have that in place by the 1st of March. We'll have the most sophisticated system all over the country that there is. And for that reason, for the reason of the attitude, for the recognition, Another thing happened from 1973 to 76 was that a lot of businessmen began to realize after farm income dropped again how valuable it was, how important it was. When we first started out, we used the word holding action rather than the word strike. American Ag come on the scene two years ago and they used the word strike and got away with it. Because during that period, remembering what we had done, and noticing that the airline stewardess, the pilots, the football players, the basketball players, the teachers, everyone used collective bargaining. And it's a much more acceptable term. So I believe that now is the first time we've had a chance. And I have no doubt that we're going to get there. Absolutely none at all. A part of it is going to be 
what we're going to show you now. For about the next hour and a half, we're going to give you a condensed version of our seminars. And people can get excited with education. Education is a funny thing. Once you start to learn, you want to learn more. There's a lot to the grain program. And it's been an almost an impossibility to go to out down the road, visit with one of our members or a non-member over the hood of his pickup or on his ki in his kitchen and explain our program. Mainly because most of the time when you're one-on-one, -on -one, the other fellow wants to do the talking. And it's very difficult. He closes you out. So we really need a captive audience we talked about in our seminars when we were setting them up that maybe we should have a two-day. And the seminar you're going to hear is only seminar one. We're going to go into seminar two, three, four, five. There's a lot to it. Anytime you develop your own system, you have to learn how. And that's what our program is all about getting our people to understand really what we're trying to do and where we've had these seminars, the people have been very excited about them. We're going to be asking you to set them up in your own areas. We're going to be charging you for them. Because we have a new policy in the organization, we're not going out for crisis drives. We have to pay our way. It costs a lot of money to put these seminars, the material that you have in front of you, the people that we have to train, the travel, cost money. The most important thing about charging you to put it on is to get you to work together. We got down to the position in the organization where we had about half of the counties that were dead, another quarter that were almost dead, and a fourth that were somewhat alive. But it's a new ball game today mainly because of need. And another reason, I hope we have become more professional and know how to teach, and maybe we'll all become a little more intelligent and want to learn more. It's an exciting program. You'll not get all of it because it's a condensed version. So with that, I'd like to introduce Vance Combs, who is Director of Procurement and Education in the Grain Department. Been my friend for a long time, tremendous person to work with, and I enjoy him immensely. Vance Combs. Today we're going to cover a subject that takes us usually about seven hours to cover, and it's divided into six sections. And we're going to take them one at a time, follow the, con uh, the continuity, I give you a capsule of what you can have a full day of in your particular area any time that we can schedule it for you and you can put it together. We're going to talk today about three forces, that'll be number one, that are affecting agriculture in this world and affecting it very deeply. And they're right on the horizon. And in fact, they've landed in our backyard if you look out when you get home. Number two, we will talk about energy. We're going to define energy. We're going to tie ourselves into it in a very responsible position, extremely responsible position. Number three, we're going to talk about systems, the simplicity of them, and we're going to include in that area a three commandments for the family farm. And they are commandments, believe me. Number four, we're going to talk about the grain trader grain procurement system. And I wish to be made, I want, I want to make it very clear at this time that I said grain trader grain procurement system. We cannot fault the entire system. That entire system is why we have been able to increase our exports from these shores from something a little over 2 billion bushels in 1970 to this year 5.6 billion. So we must have that system out there, the logistical and the marketing, transportation, distribution system they've built throughout the world to supply the hungry people of the world. 
Number four, we're going to talk, uh, that's number four. Number, number, uh, number four, we're going to talk about the grain trader grain procurement system. Number five, we're going to tell you about a system that you, that we built with your help, or you built with our help, because we are a team, that is a system of our own. The National Farmers Organization Grain Power System. It's yours. It's free. You got to learn to use it. And number six, we're going to just consider when are we going to do what we have to do and how are we going to do it. It'll be a close. And at that time, we're going to be talking about some other things that you go out through the door with. Well, I'm going to cover something right now before I forget it. We have on sale here today a must. According to the book reviewers, they declare this book should be required reading throughout this nation because it covers as well it can be covered with the secrecy that the major grain companies operate under, the most, the source and, and the movement and the manipulation of the most important form of energy that you know on this earth, and that's grain. It's on sale here by a man by the name of Dan Morgan. i have about halfway through it. I'm a little slower than most people. I have to reread the same paragraph four or five times before I get it. So it takes me a little longer. But this is a very revealing, knowledgeable research document. For heaven's sakes, buy it and take it home. We're related to energy, and here's another book that's on sale right across the hall, both of these. The seven sisters that priced their product. And when you find out what a small amount they had to price it with, it'll make us ashamed of ourselves. And that's what we're going to do in the next few minutes. Jack Lawson from the state of Montana is helping us today. Uh, I would like for uh, Ray Jorgensen to stand. He's sitting over here on my far right. He usually helps us in these kinds of things, but Ray um, got a bad ice cube in one of his drinks, and it scalded his throat. <coughs> and he, he can't talk. So at this time, I'll turn it over to Jack Lawson who is a knowledgeable man, has done great things for us in the state of Montana. We love him. I don't know whether he's got anybody else out there who loves him or not, but we do. Come in, Jack. It's a privilege to be introduced by a man who's a legend in his own time. We'll begin our discussion this morning discussing three dynamic worldwide forces that are affecting our world today. These forces are acting upon the most basic form of energy, food. We must develop an understanding of these forces and how they will affect our future. The first force is the great population explosion. I was very impressionable as a teenager in the early 50s, and I was scared tremendously by the fact that we were going to overpopulate the world, and all of a sudden it went away. No, it didn't. No, it didn't. From the time of the birth of Christ until 1900, the population growth rate of the world was approximately 1% per 100 years. We achieved a population in this world of just over 1 billion people around the year 1880. Since 1900, the population of the world has grown at a rate of 2% per year. 
and the ratio from before 1900 to after 1900 is 200 to 1. The world population today is at 4.5 billion people in a mere 80 years. 4.5 billion people. It's projected that by the year 2000, which is a mere 20 years, that population may in fact again double. Seven to nine billion people in the world by the year 2000. The question comes to mind, who will feed the population of the world? This first force concerns us. Who's going to supply them with their primary energy, their food? The only large available supplies of grain in the world are primarily here in America. We're the largest exporter in the world. If the needs of primary energy are to be filled from 1979 to the year 2000, that primary energy, that food, must be produced in nations where individuals are allowed to own their land. It must be produced by a system where productivity can increase, and the only system I know of is the family farm system. The second force we're dealing with worldwide, and of course we've seen it here in America for the last 80, 90, 100 years, is the rural to urban migration. It's a phenomenon that not only happens in industrialized nations, but is now happening in third world nations. Cities that I have never heard of soon will be ranked among the largest in the world. Cities like Bandung, somewhere in Southeast Asia. What happens when that migration takes place is really dynamic. Primarily a producer of food leaves the land, moves to the city and becomes a consumer of food dependent on someone else to supply him with his needs. As he departs from his rural area, he leaves a diet that's primarily starch-oriented, and he goes to the city and starts demanding a higher protein diet, a better diet, the Western diet. Mexico City in 1970 had approximately 8.4 million people. The projection was that by 1985 they would have nearly 18 million people. Their estimate today is that they have 15 million people. They're right on schedule, right on schedule. It requires nearly 13,000 people a week moving into Mexico City for them to gain their population. To develop a better understanding of how great the second force is, take a look at China. In 1970, China's per capita, that's my New England accent, per capita <laughs> consumption of beef was approximately 5.5, five and a half pounds of beef per person per year. For me, that's one sitting. Next year, 1980, the per capita consumption will reach 6.6 .6 pounds per person. Well, what's a pound of beef? That's a 20% increase, but what's a pound of beef? To feed China's population, that mere increase requires 495,000 tons of red meat, with eight pounds of feed grain into each one of them. Where is the feed grain required for those improving diets? Where is that feed grain going to come from? And who's going to produce it? The third force we're dealing with is perhaps the most powerful. It's claimed that today, one out of every three meals is eaten outside the home each day. 
That's always hard for rural America to understand. It's always better to eat at home. I've eaten at a McDonald's in Tokyo. I've eaten in a Kentucky Fried Chicken in Seoul, Korea. I've eaten in a Pizza Hut in Manila. Not just here, but all over the world, eating out is fashionable. It's the Western way. The projection is that by 1985, two out of three meals daily per person will be consumed outside the home. There's a great economic plum there. Who's going to price that food? Who's going to control that food? One of the groups, the chain franchises, the fast food chains. They've served notice that they, not Congress, not the farmer, will control the pricing of food and farm policy and food distribution in the world. They're buying back their franchises to make them more profitable. Who owns the fast food chains? I don't know. I would say they'll be owned by those who are best able to afford them. And what is their goal? Quite simply, to set the price on the production the same way the chain stores do it now. So here you have your three forces. A population explosion that is enormous and continuing at an ever faster rate. An urban migration that is a worldwide phenomenon. And a changing dietary habit worldwide. The demand for four more feed grains can be illustrated quite simply, I think. In 1977, Japan imported 19 million metric tons of feed grains. 19 million metric tons. And what's the significance of that? That equals the total exported grain from Canada in their best year. Japan alone. Japan alone, to meet their feed grain requirements. Always remember that the controlling of man's basic energy, food, is an even greater gold mine than the controlling of secondary energy or petroleum. And that immense gold mine is up for grabs. Who's going to get it? Who's going to get it? We've talked about primary and secondary energy. We need, need to clarify a few things on energy. All energy is nothing but stored solar power. Whether it's been stored in the ground for a million years or whether it's been stored in the ground for three months. Energy is basically that which can be converted to calories or BTUs. Hopefully you eat the calories and you heat your home with the BTUs. There are some distinctions we must make about the two, because they're quite different. Primary energy is food. It's been said that all flesh is grass and all grass is grain. Primary energy is renewable annually on a short-term basis. Basically, it's non-depletable. It's non-toxic. It's life-giving. It builds the soil. It cleans the air. It creates oxygen. Secondary energy or fossil fuels are toxic and can be extremely toxic. can destroy the land, pollutes the air, not easily renewable, takes millions of years, and is definitely depletable. 
primary energy is produced for the, for the most part. Three large nations produce the most primary energy, the United States, the Soviet Union, People's Republic of China. Those same three countries own the largest reserves of secondary energy. Same countries, United States, Soviet Union, and People's Republic of China. What's perhaps more interesting is the United States and producers in the United States control approximately 50 percent of all of the world's exportable grains. Now you've heard of OPEC. I guess they got started in 1953, but I didn't hear about OPEC until 1973 when I noticed the pump price. OPEC controls 7 percent, approximately, of the world's known reserves of secondary energy. They have direct control of between 17 and 30 percent of the world's exportable secondary energy, or petroleum specifically. And yet that group has been able to price the product. There's only one reason for that. They developed a system to serve their own needs. What is a system? We have the postal service, that's a system. We have the educational system, that's a system. But you can't get an education at the post office and you'd have trouble getting your teacher to deliver your mail, a system can do only what it's designed to do. That's all there is to a system. Nothing complicated about systems. But there's three commandments for systems. I always thank Vance for that because God had ten. We've only got three. Are you ready? The first commandment is, any group who fails to create its own system is doomed to serve another. If you don't have one of your own, by God, you're going to serve somebody else's. I believe that. Those who tried to fight the school system to set up free schools, independent schools to educate their own children found out about it. They didn't have a system. They had to design one. It isn't easy to design a system. It takes time. It's tough, hard work. The second commandment, when a system fails, breaks down, and there is no other system to take over, then you have chaos, anarchy. Watch a nation whose government falters. Look at Iran today where a strong-minded, military-controlled government failed and the chaos that results. And the third commandment, perhaps the most important, this is rather long, we'll go over it twice. Any group who refuses to contract a service or a commodity essential to a basic industry may have that service or commodity forced into that basic industry by repressive means. Any group, we producers, who refuse to contract a service or a commodity, grain, essential to a basic industry, the international grain trade, pressured to feed an ever-expanding population, may have that service or that commodity forced into that basic industry by repressive means, low prices. And to understand why that's essential, we need to look at the grain 
trader grain procurement system. And for that, Mr. Combs. Thank you. And the packets that you received today when you came in, those green packets, uh, you have a copy of that on a half sheet in there. And I wish you would take that home. Don't put it with your Bible because you don't read your Bibles. Put it by, te put it by your telephone where you're constantly tempted to call that old trader system and feed it. Sometimes I think that uh, some of us enjoy feeding that old system, hoping it'll consume us last. I'm going to talk to you now about the grain trader grain procurement system. And as I said in my uh, forward that I want that distinction really kept clear. We are not enemies. We, the producers of the most essential form of energy on earth, are not enemies to the people who transport and market our product throughout the world. We are adversaries, and we live in an adversary-oriented world. The systems that we have are adversary systems. The legal system that we have is strictly an adversary system. The educational system that we have is strictly an adversary system. Johnny's got to do better than Mary next door. Or I'm not going to have my kid whipped by the bully. I'm going to teach him to box. I'll take care of that guy. We live in an adversary system. We are not enemies. The minute we become enemies, we're in trouble. Adversaries are friends. They can sit down and talk together, argue about something, and walk out shaking hands. Did you ever see two lawyers leave a courtroom after they just got through dissecting the, each other all over that room? They go out and have lunch together. They're adversaries. And this is an attitude that we have got to develop. One of the disciplines that we must put in force with ourselves. For so many years, uh, we said that the processors were farming the farmers, so we were going to process our processors. Who would, have, who would have eaten them if we had a? See, that's... Those are loose words. Those are things that you, you hear down in a, in a bar room or a restaurant or the country store out there on the corner where you gather to lie to each other. Gonna let that soak in a little. <laughs> so we're going to talk about the grain trader grain procurement system. I want every one of you there's in uh, this folder also, there's a copy of your bylaws and constitution, I think, if we didn't run out of them. They, I was stealing them up in the office and they made me quit. You may have one. If you don't, uh, go to the preamble and read that. You're going to have one before you leave here if you attend a national convention and read it. It very specifically states in there that we do not want to sit on the board of directors of the people who process our commodities. We merely want to have something to say when it pertains to the price or the, service, or the amount of money we get for the services rendered and the commodity we surrender to, that, to the population. So I'm going to talk to you about the grain trader grain procurement system, and we're going to analyze it by using about four points. What it has to do, how it does it, why it does it that way, and when does it fail?
Now, the point I first wish to make about a grain trader or any trader is his dependency upon his supply and his great concern about protecting that source of supply. That's his number one effort. He goes out here and he puts millions and billions of dollars into an international grain logistical system and sales system and trains people and establishes offices all over the world and then he ran out of grain. He'd be broken about a month. He has to have grain. Did you ever see, and I use this analogy, did you ever see a grain elevator out here that wasn't getting any grain, try to run and got his cheese up that leg? <laughs> did I make the point that it's pretty essential to him that he has grain? So naturally, wouldn't it follow that any system that he built would be basically to protect that source of supply? So he did. He built a system that would guarantee, and this is what it has to do, he would guarantee that he'd have a, an abundant supply of that commodity any place, any time he needed it. It's that simple. It's a one-liner. That's what the system has to do. If his system doesn't work, he doesn't get a source of supply, and he's had it. Because, you see, he has to sell short. The competition makes him do that. The demand throughout the world. We've already sold a good portion of our 1980 crop, and is, have you seen any, much of it through the ground yet? Have you sold any of it? He sold short. Anytime you sell short, you sell something you don't own. So you ha have to have a pretty, pretty sure system developed out there that you're going to get it when you need it and any amounts that you need it in. So that's how what a system has to do. Once we understand the simplicity of it and the futility in trying to use it to get us a price, we'll all hang our heads. The next thing I'm going to talk to you about, the next way we're going to look at it is how does it do it? And it's a one-liner again. It's almost juvenile. It does it with low prices. Go back to commandment three. He does it with low prices. He built that system because we have not yet learned to discipline ourselves to follow and obey commandment three. Now, what do low prices stimulate? I want you to think about this. You don't all have to answer me in one big shout that's 100% correct. It stimulates, number one, Efficiency, this awful drive for efficiency, this stupid pursuit of a price you don't control. And if you caught it, it wouldn't be in the best interest of the person who did control it. So we go to seminars all winter, listening to how we can buy a bigger tractor that we don't have to pay any interest on until next September. It costs us 80, 90,000 bucks, 70,000 bucks. In fact, I was going down the road the other day in the fall and you combine it and I ran under the shadow of something and I looked around and there weren't any trees, but I looked over there and there's one of those tractors. I drove along in the shade of it for a while. Had to speed up a little. And I looked up in it, and there sat a young fellow with a pair of $100 earphones on, listening to the radio to how to get more efficient. <laughs> That's what it stimulates. You see, it, it gives him a greater supply. And then the second one that I like to talk about that it stimulates, it stimulates your urge to haul it all to town to pay your bills every year. And that system is a good system because it works for him. 
And he built it. And he built it to serve him, not you. Can you blame him? When you didn't have one whereby you could become contractable on the basis of a fair profit, or you didn't use the one that was structured for you? His works. When are you going to start using yours? Now, he has a whole lot of other gimmicks that he uses to keep this thing going. How does he maintain low prices? Well, he gets a little help from Uncle once in a while. You know, Uncle always reminds me of a, a broke bum that wants to get into a poker game. The grain trader and the grain producer are sitting there having a little game. We're adversaries, right? They got what we want, the market. We got what they want, the grain to supply it with. So we have a little, nice little game going. We have enormous amounts of power on either side, and we're pretty well balanced out. And here comes a guy through the door with a pair of striped pants on and a high hat and an empty pocketbook. And he wants to be dealt a hand. He wants to get in the act because, you see, he has to use your grain in international diplomacy. He has to use your grain to force foreign nations to allow the corporations in. He has to use your grain to keep them from g raising grain so they all go to town and buy hard goods. So they migrate to the cities. So he wants to play in the game. Now, I was secretary of an Elks Lodge when I was a young man for about six, seven years, and I used to remember when some old boys sit around that table. And before you sit down there with them, you showed them some money, their money, on the table. But you see, this guy plays with our money and the grain trader's money. He hasn't got any of his own. How much longer are you going to let him do that? I'm going to ask you, who, who rescinded and nullified the dollar and a quarter wheat loan program and the 90 cent corn loan program in 1973? Congress? You see, inadvertently, you got the cost of production plus a reasonable profit and quite a bit more. And you didn't need his damn green loan program. And it just went away. And Uncle was forced out of the poker game. And he was a very unhappy person. But he got back in. We'll cover it if we got time before this is over with. He got back in. And man, is he playing. This time when he came into the game, you dealt him a hand. He didn't like it, so he had another one up his sleeve. Four aces and a king for a kicker. <laughs> That's your loan program you got, folks. It's a minimum wage law for stupid, unorganized farmers. You didn't know you had one of those, did you? The government never has given uh, any minority group more than a minimum wage. Look at labor. 18% of the labor force, I think, is about what they got organized. They get around seven, seven and a half an hour, and the unorganized have a delicious handout by the government called $2.90 an hour. <laughs> Don't laugh. You joined the club, too. <laughs> <laughs> this is that system. Okay, let's take a look at it. From why does it have to do that way? This will wipe the smiles off your face. Why does it have to do that? Let's go back to those three commandments again. The reason it has to do it is because we didn't build commandment and follow commandment one. We didn't build our own system. We got one. We didn't use it. We're beginning to. When their system failed and we didn't have another one, chaos. And there's a white paper 
that I hope to write someday or get somebody who can write, like Georgie, about how they put you back in the cage between 1973 and 1975. It took considerable effort on the part of two presidents and four secretaries of the cabinet. And we have it documented. If we have time, when, when do you invite us to your, to your local counties for our seminars that run all day, we will take you through that gap. And it'll bring back some very unfond memories to you. Now that's the, why, the reason it has to do it that way. Because we, we don't become contractable as soon as we get a profit. Please turn tape to side two.